Great, welcome everyone. My name is Tristan Claridge and I'm the convener of this webinar series for the International Social Capital Association. Uh, the association's mission is to advance the research and application of the social capital concept and the application is now welcoming new members. In this session, we welcome Celine Labor for a presentation about coping with urban shrinkage, the role of informal social capital in French medium-sized shrinking cities. Soline is an urban scholar who combines ethnographic methods and critical theoretical approaches from geography and sociology to explore the everyday politics of urban change. She studies how urban actors' everyday experience and negotiation of urban change contribute to reproducing, transforming, and sometimes challenging unequal socio-spatial orders. Her PhD research examined the everyday politics of urban shrinkage, including residence agentive uh, mitigation of stigma, sensory micropolitics in impoverishing and eth ethnically diversifying neighborhoods and construction and mobilization of urban symbols and the role of public actors in recomposing social capital weakened by long-term out-migration. We're delighted you've agreed to give this webinar. Welcome, Celine, and over to you for the presentation. Um, hi, everyone, and um, thank you, Tristan, for uh, for the invitation and for the introduction. Um, so, um, as Tristan just explained, um, uh, my overall research focuses on the everyday politics of um, structural urban change processes. Um, so, and my PhD was on um, more specifically urban shrinkage and shrinking cities. So this is how I um, I became interested in in social capital in shrinking cities. It was um, it was part of an interrogation uh, on how urban shrinkage um, affected people and um, how they were able to deal with it and um, the issue of social ties and social capital uh, very quickly. Um, became a central um, a central topic in this research project. Um, but um, since I'm talking to a social capital audience, uh, before I say more about my research, um, I think it's useful if I explain just a little bit more about the kind of uh, phenomenon that I was um, that I was studying, urban shrinkage, uh, to give you a little bit of background. Um, so basically, what we're talking about when we're talking about sh urban shrinkage. Um, this is a term that designates a multidimensional uh, phenomenon of urban uh, decline, so um, which includes um, economic and employment decline and uh, demographic decline, of course. Um, so the main characteristics which happen on the which which become a structural trend and happens on the long term, and it also comes along with other main manifestations or trends or dynamics. Um, including um, um, a degradation of the built environment uh, because of underuse or, or, or vacancy. Um, it also comes with um, um, local financial issues because there's a decreasing tax base and, um, and also an impoverishment of the population. Um, and in general, it's caused by a, com well, I mean, in most cases, it's caused by a combination of um, deindustrialization, um, suburbanization as well, and uh, metropolization, which is the agglomeration of um, people and economic activities in the largest uh, cities. So um, unsurprisingly, this is a phenomenon which affected particularly um, um, Western um, industrialized or deindustrialized countries and uh, especially um, historically industrial regions, um, like, for instance, the war in Germany, the Rust Belt in the US, or the northeast of uh, France. And um, there's one important dimension of this phenomenon, which is which uh, is important in, um, in the context of this research, and this is the issue of out-migration. Um, in general, these cities have um, negative migration balance, so more people tend to leave. Um, but this out-migration doesn't happen in a homogeneous way. Um, it does not concern all population groups in the same way. 
so it's mostly uh, younger people that tend to leave more, um, generally for study or professional purposes, and also um, middle class or upper middle class uh, groups. And, and this has some consequences on the population's uh, socioeconomic structure um, in terms mostly of impoverishment and uh, aging as well. So in this context of uh, growing, um, growing uh, scholarly attention to this phenomenon, urban shrinkage, there's been also an increasing attention to um, the role of social capital uh, in these areas. And mostly uh, because it was increasingly seen as um, a potential um, resource for community-led uh, initiatives, um, potentially an, an alternative tool for planning in these cities. Um, and I will say a bit more about this perspective or this argument in a minute. Uh, but before I, 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 I elaborate, I also wanted to specify um, how I use the concept of social capital in, in my work. So um, I, I use, um, I follow a Bourdieuian approach to social capital. Um, I use the definition by Bourdieu and Vacan. Um, and I use this definition particularly because it leaves room for both the um, individual and the community level at which we can measure social capital and uh, also to more or less uh, institutionalized um, social ties. And, and also, preci um, precisely or relatedly, um, for the purpose of uh, the analysis, uh, I distinguish between two forms of social capital, formal and informal social capital. Um, so the former, formal social capital, I understand as uh, the resources that are derived from uh, belonging and participating in uh, institutionalized relationship, relationships, so or or organizations, uh, for instance, associational activities. And the latter, informal social capital, I um, I understand as um, the resources that are obtained through uh, belonging and participation in non-institutionalized relationships. So relationships that do not require formal or explicit acceptance into a group. Uh, for instance, friendships, uh, uh, neighborly relationships, family relationships. And making this distinction um, um, helps me make sense of the different scholarly approaches uh, to social capital in shrinking cities that I was uh, seeing and, and trying to connect. Um, so I'll say more about this um, now. Um, as I was saying just before, um, the question of social capital in the context of shrinkage uh, has attracting um, increasing attention, but from different scholarly approaches, different scholarly perspectives. And uh, in, in this research, I draw mostly on two approaches. So the first one is a more policy-oriented approach which comes mostly from geography and planning and focuses specifically on urban shrinkage and shrinking cities. And the other one is um, a sociological perspective developed particularly uh, within uh, French sociology and um, investigating more like post-industrial uh, towns or villages. Um, so um, I will start with the first one, the policy-oriented approach. Uh, the dominant perspective in this approach is on how social capital can contribute to solve problems related to urban shrinkage. So basically social capital as a planning tool to change the place. So for instance, these studies, they, they show how uh, they show the role of social capital in uh, planning processes um, to involve community members or uh, the role of social capital to address problems um, related to shrinkage, such as building vacancy. And in addition, um, this perspective also uh, focuses on a more collective and more um, um, uh, form formalized or institutionalized um, forms of um, social capital. So generally it investigates um, uh, groups that have been formally recognized as a community actor. It investigates or it analyzes their capacity to act collectively in an organized fashion to achieve a specific goal. Um, and um, um, I, well, 
while I don't deny um, the added value of the initiatives that are studied um, in, in this perspective, I identify some limitations to approaching social capital mostly from this perspective. So um, there are three limitations mainly. Uh, the first one is that it raises questions of uh, social spatial justice uh, because it advocates for um, transferring responsibilities to residents, responsibilities which in other areas, growing or wealthier areas, are supported by public or private actors. So it's also a discourse that can tend to um, legitimize austerity measures. Um, secondly, the second limitation is that social capital is not, is not evenly distributed. Uh, so the risk of policies that rely too much on social capital for urban redevelopment is that it aggravates uh, inequality uh, within the city between communities that have different level of resources, uh, different level of social capital. Um, and the last, the, 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 the third um, uh, interrogation I have is that there's, there's research that shows that in the context of urban shrinkage, um, residents may not always be um, either willing or able to engage in um, collective action uh, to address shrinkage for uh, different types of reasons. So basically, uh, this approach raises questions in terms of um, justice and uh, effectiveness. Um, then um, the second approach then that I that I that I draw on uh, the sociological perspective, um, this perspective focuses on how people's um, daily lives and how uh, their experience of place is influenced by uh, social capital and how social capital itself is um, uh, is impacted by the transformation of the place. So it's kind of the other way around. Um, and these studies, they uh, focus mostly on uh, lower income groups. And they show that for these groups, um, social capital um, is strongly place-based. So it's locally anchored, place dependent. Um, and in French sociology, the type of social capital is called uh, capital d'autochtonie. Uh, so autochtony capital, basically, the capital derived from being from there. Um, and also, un, um, unlike the policy-oriented approach, these studies tend to approach social capital uh, more individually and informally. So for instance, they will show how belonging to a close-knit um, network of friends will give you access to um, hustles and side jobs um, uh, that help supplement uh, one's income. Um, and here as well, uh, there's also one limitation that I identify, um, which is that this perspective tends to focus on social capital or it, it focuses on how social capital works for individuals who have a strong um, social network and high social recognition. And it does recognize that some individuals are much more isolated, but this aspect constitutes more of a blind spot in this perspective. So the fact that it's unevenly distributed and some people are excluded from these um, 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 this bonding social capital, basically. Um, so with this background, what I wanted to understand was how uh, various forms of social capital are transformed in the context of shrinkage, but also how they are used and how they can help inhabitants. Um, and, and I wanted to also understand how this involves residents, but also possibly other urban actors. So what I argue in the research is that the two perspectives needs to be connected and we need to acknowledge uh, both forms of social capital, not overly focus on one or the other, but we also need to look at them together to see how they interact because they do not work separately. Um, so um, before I start presenting the the results that lead me to this argument, um, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, very briefly present um, the places where I conducted my research and, and how I conducted it. Um, so um, the analysis, um, uh, for the analysis, I draw on two ethnographic studies. Um, so I used ethnographic methods, but in, uh, in this research, more specifically, I rely on the semi-structured interviews I conducted. So I conducted um, 110 interviews mm 
uh, between in 2020 and 2021, uh, mostly with residents, but also I conducted expert interviews. And uh, the two case studies are two medium-sized cities in France uh, called Nevers and Dieppe. So um, Nevers is the red dot in the center of the map here, and uh, Dieppe is the red dot in the north uh, on the coast. And uh, both cities have been shrinking since the mid-70s, approximately. Um, and uh, they both lost, uh, so they're both about 60,000 inhabitants for the whole or agglomeration. Um, and both of them, for the inner municipality, they lost about 29% of their population since the 70s. Um, so for Nevers, Nevers uh, um, is located in a rural region. Um, it's a city that had more of an industrial and commercial character with industrial towns um, uh, um, surrounding the city. And uh, it suffered from several waves of economic decline, but also from the reduction of public services, especially since the 2000s. Um, for instance, the, there was a military garrison that closed uh, in 1999. Um, and as for Dieppe, it's a port city, and it's uh, it suffered from both suburbanization and economic and employment decline, and mostly from the decline of the, the commercial activities of the port. Okay. So now I'm coming to the analysis, uh, and the analysis is structured in three parts. So basically, first, I examine the transformations of social capital in the context of shrinkage, and I show that it tends to, um, to, to, to weaken. Uh, second, I examine how uh, social capital constitutes an important resource for the residents who have a strong social capital, so it's definitely not uh, something to um, uh, overlook. Uh, and finally, I examine the interaction between formal and informal social capital, and I show um, the role of um, uh, more institutionalized social actors in the community to foster both formal and informal social capital. So uh, we'll start with the first part. Um, and the first thing we can see um, is that social capital is indeed quite affected uh, in the context of shrinkage. Um, and uh, more specifically, it tends to diminish or to weaken, uh, mostly because of out-migration and impoverishment. Uh, and out-migration is really the main, uh, the main factor here. Um, so first, um, out-migration for, for the people who remain, well, this results in a weakening of social networks. Um, and this, as I said, out-migration is selective. Um, so this concerns some population groups more than others, uh, and it's particularly uh, elderly people that are affected. Um, so basically the people whose children or grandchildren have left the city, um, and particularly uh, elderly people who live alone, and um, maybe because of, uh, probably because of life, life expectancy reasons, I met many women in this case. Um, and for the people who are in the situation of uh, weakening so or dismantling social networks, um, this is mainly felt through increased um, isolation and loneliness. So um, this, this shows how um, um, the weakening of social capital is not just felt collectively in terms of um, decreasing capacities to initiate uh, community-led projects, but it is also felt individually in terms of well-being and uh, experience of place. Um, and I'll just add that um, to a lesser extent, I also observed this um, for younger people who were new to the city because there was a high turnover of young people uh, coming uh, to the city for professional reasons, but not leaving, uh, not staying, sorry. Um, and so the, the, a lot of people who um, arrived in the city struggled to make durable connections because they were in the age range where people were leaving. Um, then regarding impoverishment, this is a little bit less straightforward and less easy to observe. Um, and uh, he, this time it's not really related to um, um, the, 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 the strength of one's so social network, but rather the access to social networks and social opportunities. So um, I could observe this in some cases when it was explicitly mentioned to me, um, 
uh, that the limited financial means also meant limited access to social activities and uh, limited access to uh, make new social connections. Uh, basically, um, this is when uh, you have to pay for um, engaging in social activities. Um, so uh, this is something I observed less often that was also um, described less often by participants because I think it's less straightforward. But since impoverishment is one of the main dimension of shrinkage, um, I think this is still quite a significant um, element. So the first result, the first part of the analysis confirms that um, we should approach it with caution when thinking of social capital as um, a, a ready to use tool for um, policy and planning um, in shrinking cities, because as this shows, it is indeed uh, weakened and uh, diminished. That being said, uh, and this takes me to the second part, um, the fact that social capital is weakened, that doesn't mean that it's inexistent. Um, so um, now I'm turning to how it helps people uh, coping with some of the difficulties related to shrinkage um, when, when, when it's there, basically. Um, and I could definitely identify that is, it, it does constitute a critical resource for individuals who have this um, place-based social capital, um, that the one I was describing earlier, the capital d'autochtonie. Um, but from what I could observe, the benefits accrued more at the individual level um, rather than the, at the collective level. So um, in what I observed, it did not so much help the community as much as it really helped individuals in their individual trajectory. Um, and uh, so this point, I, I Sorry, I illustrate this point um, using a specific example of um, a participant. Uh, so it's the case of um, a young man who is in his uh, early 30s. And uh, he's from a working class background, family um, long established in the city, uh, working in the you know, port activities, fishing uh, industry, and uh, in Dieppe. And so he left the city to study. And he started a career as a graduate um, elsewhere. But then after a while, he decided to come back to his hometown because he um, he uh, privileged um, social well-being and his social network over uh, the career. But this return to the hometown came at the cost of his professional trajectory because he had to quit his job to um, come back, and he couldn't find um, he couldn't easily find um, uh, an equivalent job in his hometown. Um, but then. Uh, on the other hand, um, locally, he had a very strong social network, a very strong social capital, which he nurtured also over the years of being away. Um, and eventually he was asked for, um, uh, he was asked, he was contacted by the mayor and he was asked to join the, 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 the list for the municipal elections. And uh, he became a municipal, municipal delegate and now he has political responsibilities. So basically for him, the return to the hometown meant a trade-off between different forms of capital. It meant giving up on um, economic and, and symbolic capital, so basically giving up on his career, but regaining um, but more social capital. Uh, and he was able to eventually convert this social capital into um, back into symbolic capital, um, this time not through his profession, but through his political responsibilities. So. What I find interesting in this, um, in the in his case, uh, is not that it's representative because uh, the trajectory of young graduates who come back to the city um, is quite the exception, not the rule. Um, but it does show, um, in an exemplary way, how social capital can become a critical resource um, to navigate different forms of capital, um, um, especially in. Um, in, in the in the context of uh, uh, of a shrinking city, um, so basically his example suggests that um, um, rather than functioning directly as a tool to solve uh, community level problems, social capital can definitely help individuals um, in in their trajectory. So basically, to to simplify. Um, trying to solve residents' problems rather than trying to solve the city's problems. 
Uh, and it's, it also shows that it can be a critical resource, but the benefits are not necessarily like the most um, uh, direct. Uh, it can be in indirect ways. So the question that then comes up um, is, how does that play out considering the uneven distribution of social capital and its weakening? How does this play out for people who don't, do not have this strong place-based social capital as uh, this uh, young man that I was uh, talking about? Uh, and this brings me to the last uh, part of the analysis. Um, so. What I examine in the last uh, part of the analysis is, um, as I announced earlier, the interaction between formal and informal forms of social capital. And um, this brings out the role of more institutional social actors in fostering social capital. And especially for the people who are more isolated and who have seen their social capital uh, weaken. And um, I could observe this uh, in particular uh, in a community center where I conducted part of my research in Nevers. Um, so um, um, the community center was a source of social capital in two different ways for the people who went there. Um, first, um, it was a source of social capital in a more formal and institutionalized way through the activities that it uh, organizes. So that corresponds really to the more um, official goal of the community center, which is officially to foster social connections in the community. Uh, and here in particular, uh, there was one uh, specific profile uh, of participants who, um, um, who, which was quite frequent, uh, and uh, they were quite sensitive to this function of the community center. And this profile corresponded to uh, middle-aged or elderly women who had experienced um, 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 a, a difficult life event, like a divorce or um, becoming a widow or an illness. And uh, for them, coming to the, the, the for them the community center was a way to start anew and to rebuild a social network after a period of social isolation. Um, and um, they described very clearly the benefits of this in terms of mental health and social well-being. Uh, but then secondly, and in a more informal way, what I also could observe, uh, maybe less often, but uh, still in se several cases, was that the, the center then served as a basis to rebuild a more informal network of friendships and to rebuild a social life uh, beyond the center. Um, and here, in this case, uh, in addition to the benefits in terms of well-being, uh, the participants also described uh, the development of mutual support networks. Um, so more concrete benefits, uh, for instance, uh, help to buy groceries, help uh, driving each other, for instance, to medical appointments or checking, each, uh, checking on each other in case of illness. Um, so this second part shows that social actors like community centers, um, they act as a kind of safety net in this context of weakening social networks. And they provide both collective and formalized, um, uh, well, a, a collective and organized, sorry, a collective and formalized organization, but they also help people build informal social capital, which helps them more at the individual level. So it works um, in parallel, basically. Um, and this brings me to my conclusion. Um, so um, I want to conclude with uh, some of the key ideas of this um, presentation. Um, for the anecdote, the picture that you see on the conclusion, it's a project um, uh, that the community center tried to, um, to set up of um, uh, a more formalized uh, way to enable mutual help and mutual support. And uh, what I found interesting is that this initiative, which was much more organized and formalized, didn't work. So it worked for some people who had built these informal ties through the activities of the community center. But when the center tried to um, uh, formalize and, and, and um, let's say, scale up such mechanisms, uh, it didn't work as well. And partly because the community center um, 
switched to a more um, top-down uh, approach to that kind of project. Anyway, um, so um, back to my conclusion. Um, uh, so my primary aim was to examine how social capital can contribute to our understanding of shrinking cities. And I wanted to understand how it was transformed and how it was used in the context of shrinkage. Um, and I started by highlighting these two different approaches to social capital in shrinking cities, which I tried to connect. And um, what my findings show is that first, yeah, social capital is very much affected uh, by the changes related to shrinkage and it is weakened, uh, especially informal social capital. But um, when it's there, it is a critical resource to, to deal uh, with some of the difficulties related to shrinkage, at least at the individual level. So not really, uh, yeah, at least at the individual level. Uh, and eventually I highlight the role of social actors like community centers in um, addressing uh, this, uh, this weakening and um, the, this uneven distribution of social capital. So these findings, they suggest different ways through which policy can use social capital in shrinking cities. Um, not only by relying on organized communities, uh, but also supporting um, social uh, actors in their role of fostering social capital and not, see, not seeking only to solve city level problems, but also by addressing um, social well-being at the individual level. And I think this is quite important because a tendency in shrinking cities is to prioritize um, um, major urban redevelopment plans that aim to tackle shrinkage to solve um, the problems at city level. And then um, because of financial, uh, the scarcity of financial resources, um, this often impacts negatively the community actors like the community center I was studying. And these, these findings, on the other hand, they highlight the importance of these community act, um, actors uh, in addressing some problems related to shrinkage, but just they do it in a, in a way that is less visible. Um, and with this, I will uh, stop here and uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any question. Great, thanks for the presentation. I will maybe, uh, thank you. I will maybe escape the screen. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Uh, so we'll take some some questions and, and comments if anybody would like to uh, either raise your hand within Zoom. Um, you can find that under the reactions button. Or you can post in the chat, uh, and when we come to you, if you could unmute yourself to ask your question. Alternatively, if you're not in a position to to uh, to unmute yourself and to ask the question yourself, I'd be quite happy to read it out on your behalf. Um, just indicate that in the chat if that's the case. So we have a little bit of time for question um, questions. Thought I might start with the first one, which is probably more of an observation uh, that your your research highlight something that is so important and perhaps um, not particularly well understood about the role of, of uh, urban shrinkage and the way in which we might be able to uh, change the social environment that occurs as part of that process because you, you've seemed to have highlighted a quite what is potentially a very negative cycle in in urban centers that are shrinking where you have that erosion of social networks as people leave and so rather than people's networks uh, becoming bigger or perhaps maintaining in their size, a lot of people's networks perhaps are actually shrinking in their size as a result of people leaving. And people may be able to go out and meet new people and maintain the size of their networks. But like you're saying, it also tends to be associated with higher rates of mobility as well. And so people, uh, the research quite strongly supports the idea that in areas of high mobility, people don't tend to actually try to meet their neighbors and try to meet their friends because they figure, well, what's the point? They're probably gonna move on in, in a few months time or in six months from now, they'll they'll move anyway. And I will have tried to, to make friends with people and the, the, then they'll be gone anyway. So if we have that process of eroding networks that aren't being re replenished and replaced as a result of mobility or the possibility of mobility, and at the same time, you highlighted the impoverishment as well, and that being a driver of, um, I guess, both reduced abilities to realize the benefits of social capital, that if if the general community has less uh, resources, assets, things that they can share and mobilize within the community, then there can be fewer 
uh, beneficial outcomes of social capital. And at the same time, people may be uh, not able to socialize quite as much. And so it seems like we, we have this almost like a negative cycle that simply perpetuates itself where, where social capital declines, that sense of place perhaps becomes more negative, people then potentially are more likely to move away from the area, and it kind of just gets worse. Uh, so that's a very long summary, I think, perhaps of, of the way that I've understood some of your research findings, if you have any comment on, on the accuracy of what I've just said. No, but that that summarizes it pretty well. Um, and uh, what I find interesting is that how um, um, how this doesn't happen in a homogeneous way. So um, um, among my respondents, um, I met a lot of people who were very integrated uh, and um, would not have the same experience as what I was describing. Um, so depending on your social background um, and your age, um, and your yeah um, geographic geographical trajectory, uh, you might not have the same experience at all. Uh, but this issue of isolation was uh, definitely a very present issue, um, especially with the population groups that I um, described. Um, and um, yeah, it does um, it it does have very um, um, very important effects in um, in uh, in people's lives. And um, uh, I think I was. Um, a little bit uh, frustrated when I started this research with uh, a maybe overly optimistic view of social capital that I was reading in shrinkage related research um, on how shrinkage uh, social capital could do so many great things. But I saw also many people who um, were struggling. Um, so were not uh, involved in uh, all these great, you know, grassroots organizations and community led initiatives. So that's what drove me to um, to to try to investigate, um, yeah, the, the the other side of the coin, basically. Uh, but I, I don't want to monopolize the. So maybe there are other questions that. Uh, that yeah, there uh, are a couple that, of other questions you know. coming up, but if if we just stay on that for for a moment longer, I think the the unequal access is so important to highlight how, um, particularly I, you talked about the elderly who, when their social network erodes and perhaps gets smaller, it may be much more difficult for them to, to, to increase the size of their network to meet new people. And that may not be the case for people in other areas of society, say younger people or people who are actively working. You know, we in some of the social capital research, it focuses on perhaps the, the limit that you can only know so many people, you know, like once you get beyond 150 people, it's hard to remember people's names and faces and put it, keep it all together. And um, that's a very optimistic view of, of what social capital may look like. And clearly in areas where, uh, you know, shrinking cities and urban areas, it's far more likely to be that you've only got half a dozen friends and then some of them start moving away and it actually gets smaller and smaller. And it's, it's certainly not a problem with remembering people's names and faces at the other end of the scale. So highlighting that, I think, is is really important. And, and like you said, that there, there tends to be an assumption that social capital is this... Uh, effectively free available resource that uh, city planners and policymakers can can take advantage of can make use of to improve social outcomes but it's just as likely for urban shrinkage to result in uh, you know a negative view of place that ultimately results in very negative social capital and negative outcomes and a reduced ability to to uh, to produce positive benefits of outcomes so that's that's just as likely or perhaps more likely to occur in urban shrinkage than for people to you know come together with a shared sense of purpose or a shared goal to overcome the challenges of urban shrinkage which is a, another possible way in which social capital could be strengthened but like you said that really needs to be done through those more formal social capital processes where it's more explicit yeah. that they're coming together here is our purpose and we can get behind it and we can have that that common sense of identity behind that um that goal yeah uh yeah i have uh, i have several thoughts uh, coming up um with the um, with your comments um the first one is well about this uh yeah the the, the fact that we're talk i i mentioned elderly people mostly uh and and really i i want to highlight how uh in people's accounts the transition to retirement was a crucial uh, moment and uh, in the negative sense, um, because it's, uh, it's also a moment of, well, yeah, suddenly the social network um, erodes a lot, but also it's a moment of um, um, 
sources of social recognition, so also of symbolic capital, uh, suddenly uh, change um, and sometimes disappear. Um, so this can really um, be a triggering point, but really also um, uh, in the cases that I um, saw at the community center, it was an individual life event, a difficult life event. Um, and secondly, um, about what you were saying at the end on uh, on um, yeah getting involved in shrinking cities, um, I think this. So I, I very briefly mentioned it at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, there's also research that that shows that um, there is also weakening of more formal forms of social capital um, uh, because sometimes people in shrinking cities. Um, well, either they're in a situation where um, economic survival is more important. So this is the primary, uh, this is the priority and uh, getting involved in community projects is not. Um, or also there is something we have to imagine that we're talking about trends that happen over, you know, half a century. So when it's been happening for several generations and you're used to your place being like that, and that doesn't mean you're not attached and satisfied to your place. Uh, um, well, you also get used to how it is, and you don't necessarily feel the urge to change the place or to address some problems. So some problems are seen as very problematic by policymakers, but not so much by residents. It's not really part of their everyday life. So, and and that also was the reason why I was specifically investigating how shrinkage translates in people's everyday life, because it's not the same experience as that of policymakers. And maybe the last thing, um, what I think what I find very interesting in the French context is this role of social actors, because there's a lot of shrinkage research that is on more, um, let's say, neoliberal contexts. Uh, there's a lot in the US, for instance. So um, um, there's not so much research where the welfare state is still uh, quite present. Um, and the community center that I was old community centers that I studied in my research. They were founded by the national agency for housing and social allowances, basically, and um, and the, the, the municipality. So they it's mostly public funding and they have employees and they work quite professionally because of this public funding. So this research also shows that, um, well, the crucial role of public support, basically, um, in comparison to other contexts, which were more frequently documented, where public support is, you know, um, non-existent, so the inhabitants really have to resort to DIY, basically. So this shows what public funding can do, basically. Yeah, I think you make a really great point too that the, the lived experience of the people who live in those areas may be entirely different than what the policymakers think it is. You know, like if. If it has been undergoing urban shrinkage for a hundred years, then the perceptions of what that means may be altogether different than than what we may think sitting uh, remotely and, and observing that and thinking, "Wow, isn't how terrible is this that the the the, the place is shrinking and people are moving away?" But if that's been fact of life and the lived reality for the last hundred years, then it, it, you know, the lived experience may be altogether different. I think that's a really important point you've made. We could talk for hours. I love talking. I'm a geographer. I love talking with other geographers. Oh. Um, <laughs> but there are other questions. I see uh, Branak has a hand up, but we do have a question in the chat first from uh, Rizik. Rizik, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you could ask the question yourself, or I'd be happy to ask it on your behalf. Yes, uh, thank you, Tristan and Solin. So I'm just uh, wondering about uh, a few points about the impoverishments that uh, you're pointing about the reduce of the access uh, of the social network. So I'm just wondering is that uh, in your research also identify uh, about the the useful, uh, useful about the digital platforms, like uh, how that people can connect it using the technologies, uh, yes, to increase the access to the social networks. So yes, that is uh, my curious questions about that. So hopefully uh, can be answering or yes, depend on your, your research. That is my, my questions. Uh, uh, Tristan and Solin. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, so if I understand well, you're wondering about uh, in terms of reduced access to social networks or social um, uh, activities, um, what so what digital networks could um, have, how this could play um, play out in this. Um, so um, I have several thoughts coming to me. Um, um, well, the first the first thing is that in terms of reduced access, this was mostly related to um, uh, the ability to pay for um, paid activities. Um, so um, um, not so much in terms of the networks themselves. Um, the problem with the networks were more the their erosion. Um, then, um, well, the, the the first obvious thing that I'm that I that I'm thinking right now is that. Since I observe this problem mostly with elderly people, uh, the digital networks were a little bit out of the picture. Uh, so, and this is also something. Actually, this is a topic that that did come out um, several times in interviews. Um, that um, 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 they were sort of aware of. So, the, the the elderly respondents I'm talking about, they were sort of aware of the possibilities that these tools could possibly bring them uh, and definitely sometimes using it with their family. But also um, th this awareness was very um, un uncertain and blurry. So basically they, did, they for most of them, they didn't master social networks and uh, digital social networks um, and they didn't know how to use it. And, and this was one of the, one of the issues uh, and they, they were also aware of this limitation. So that was sort of a concern. And actually, uh, for the anecdote, the community center offers courses in digital literacy. They, they offer courses to help people um, learn how to use a computer, learn how to use a tablet. Um, so I had conversations on, yeah, I have this tablet. My children gave it to me, but I'm not using it. I don't know how. I'm trying. No, no, no. So th this was... This came out mostly in terms of limitation for um, el more elderly people. And then um, there is a, also a sort of like place-based um, community identity that exists on social networks with like Facebook groups and things like that. Uh, but to say that this translates in social life or social capital that is primarily emerging from digital networks, this I cannot really say. I This is not something I observed. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you, Solins. That is uh, clear for me. Uh, yeah, because I'm also interested in your uh, research designs. Uh, there is any a bit similar with Indonesian's context that mostly in urban right now, uh, it's mostly happening it's like a displacement that yes the the elderly people is is the most uh discriminated uh groups it's not only f uh, because the displacements of the housings but also the government's giving like a uh, idea just using the digital platform that hopefully can can giving uh a solutions for the elderly for example but yes the fact is the elderly is still difficult to assess or to using the the many digital platform that are uh, providing by the public service for example yes thank mm -hmm. you so much Solin's presents on this uh, if i can just maybe add some tiny thing um i the digital digital platforms also helped me connecting with people who had no social connection at all because I, through Facebook groups, posts in Facebook groups or a survey that I circulated, I could reach people who were active on social networks, but didn't have connections in real life. So that was also something. Okay, interesting. Uh, let's move on to the next question from uh, Brenka. Feel free to, un to unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question or make a comment. Uh, thanks. Uh, it's a mixture of question and a comment. Uh, I'm uh, starting soon uh, studies on urban development. I really uh, appreciate your uh, presentation and your work, uh, Celine. Um, it's very, very interesting and it's something that we are not talking enough about and especially uh, uh, 
in the context of how we use the money of the welfare state to um, to do something about our cities. Uh, I think there is a question, uh, especially after lockdowns, uh, why are we living in uh, cities uh, uh, now? Uh, I'm from Croatia and here I can see on, in smaller cities another uh, um, layer on a shrinkage, which uh, uh, on the first look, it's not a shrinkage at all. Cities are uh, prospering. Uh, uh, there are lots of buildings uh, being built and so on. But the thing is that there are uh, this uh, development, uh, which is only a uh, 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 built development is actually driven by investments in tourism. And uh, it, uh, in my opinion, uh, this uh, uh, seasonal uh, uh, um, fluctuation of, of uh, uh, economic activity in these cities is diluting the social capital even more because uh, uh, for at least four months a year, maybe six months a year, uh, uh, the, cities is, uh, the city is functioning in one uh, mode and then it's functioning in another mode. And uh, uh, I guess that... Uh, I would like to look into that, that uh, uh, as soon as something is accomplished during winter uh, 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 months, then come summer months and you put all that away and uh, 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 there is a, a quite a different atmosphere in the city and different uh, happenings. Uh, since uh, the EPE is on the uh, seaside, did you see some effects of uh, tourism? I don't know about Nevers, maybe it's also, it looks pretty, <laughs> I don't know uh, how to tourist it is so i'm asking more about yeah yeah uh both um both cities are pretty but indeed Dieppe uh, is much more touristic than Nevers because of the seaside um so um tourism in Dieppe is definitely seen as something positive uh because it's a source of economic activity and it sort of took over from uh, from um you know, um, industrial activities that do not provide some um, as much employment as uh, it used to. Um, so it's it's seen as something. Um, for instance, tourism is the reason one of the reasons that in Dieppe um, shrinkage or there there is less of a feeling of decline or, sen or um, uh, a sensation of decline because uh, it makes um, a lot of things much less visible. Um, so, for instance, the decline is not so much in the commercial activity of the city center, but it's more in the impoverishment of the population. So this is less visible. Um, so tourism is mostly seen as something positive, but there is one particularity in, in Dieppe. Uh, it's one of the only cities that, uh, since uh, you know the heydays of industrial times, uh, remained uh, governed by a communist government. And uh, I think this played uh, an important role on how tourism was developed in the city because the city first never had a very active um, policy to develop tourism. Um, so even for, for in the, I think it was in the 2000s, the, the slogan for the municipal list uh, before the elections was uh, Dieppe au Diepois, so Dieppe to its inhabitants. Uh, meaning uh, not to the not to the tourists, um, and I think indirectly some of the consequences of that is that there's been less, well, there's been more money invested for the inhabitants directly. You know, social um, social organizations, uh, cultural organizations, sport organizations, um, and less in you know uh, economic um, economic uh, development. Um, and um, and uh, well, in terms of you know the impact that tourism can create on local inhabitants, you know, uh, in terms of real estate markets, uh, prices, um, the city be being suddenly overflowed with tourists, uh, I think there's been less of a feeling of dispossession for the local inhabitants uh, in relation to tourism. So the the two activities. Um, work better together um, 
of course, you know, investing less in economic development also has consequences. Um, and some people would strongly criticize that in the city. Um, but um, let's say that, uh, yeah, tourism was basically not a priority. And um, the, the, the yeah social policy were much more um, much more the priority so um yeah this this has uh, led to a specific you know social uh, and policy landscape in this city um i get my first thought when when you started your comment is that uh, there there are two main things that can happen when tourism is so, is so important and suddenly as in when the season started takes over it's it's first the access to housing and access to the well when you basically cannot access a neighborhood anymore even if you're from there because now real estate markets are too high for you but there's also something in the occupation of public space i guess because maybe a lot of social activity happens in the open and suddenly when the public space is fully taken over by tourists maybe you there's a yeah a sense of uh, uh, loss of belonging for the local inhabitants but I wouldn't say that this is happening in Jep. I, th I think it's fascinating. I was, I was reading uh, some research out of the UK that suggested that uh, locals love the tourists because they would uh, bring in money and, of course, there was employment opportunities and so forth. But um, they didn't want the tourists to be, say, winning the meat prize at the local pub. You know, so so <laughs> the tourists could do certain things and they had a certain role and they could be in certain spaces, but but perhaps not in other spaces. And and when we think about the way in which social capital forms and the way in which social interaction occurs in a geographic sense, it's that mix of, of public and private spaces that seems to be so important that you've got those uh, completely public uh, spaces where people can anyone can come and anyone can can socialize and interact but then you have the mix of of semi-private and private spaces as well which seems to be a, a really important place for social capital to occur um, particularly where you have a high number of tourists and so if you're in a completely public space you may not know who's a local and who's not and in fact in in many cases a lot of the other people perhaps aren't locals and people know that uh, trying to meet somebody and develop a relationship with a with a tourist isn't going to necessarily lead to a long term relationship <laughs> that is that is beneficial in any kind of way, uh, and so it's that mix of spaces that I think is important, and I think there's there's a, perhaps a lot more research to be done on 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 that and how we shape the built environment to facilitate the maximum I guess or the to to accentuate the possibility for for social capital to be maintained and developed. Yeah, um, I think this uh, this question of um, public or private space and semi-public space is is quite important. If I if I think of Dieppe again, um, um, for instance, the the there's something interesting going on with the uh, the the seaside, the 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 the, the beachfront, um, which most um, Dieppois, most most locals. Uh, really praise and are really attached to so the, the the seaside is a very important place uh for all the people living there um and yet at the same time it is uh um let's say from an external point of view uh, very much in need of um renovation um, um so it, it hasn't been redeveloped in in a very long time um and uh and um i think from a uh, urban planning point of view, you'd say it's a uh, it's uh, it's it's a major priority. This should definitely be redeveloped. Uh, so I thought it was very interesting to um, to uh, to observe this sort of like contradiction. Um, and this I also could observe that um, people from different social backgrounds in the city didn't have the same opinion also on on this place. So uh, and and the same practices as well. Uh, so there were more people from more middle class, upper middle class backgrounds who 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 were more critical of this place and um, and uh, and who also went to other beachfronts um, outside the city. Um, yeah, and and uh, um, and as for the semi public places, uh, I come back again to the community centers. I I, I really saw them as um, as. A, as um as a, as a, as a critical space for social interaction 
Um, but it's it's what I it's interesting because they're also so important because they are old. Um, uh, and they've been there forever and people are used to these places um so um they they it's not um it's approachable um when they try different initiatives of course it's it's new people don't really know if they're allowed um for instance if they try to sort of um, open like a community cafe um it, it's it's much more you know um uh uncertain the outcome because um, people don't the place needs to be well identified and even then um, so several people thought that the community center was not for them because there were not you know um, poor people in need so um, so they they didn't allow themselves to go so that was also an issue so I, I guess the accessibility of places is um, are, um, and uh, and this includes their appearance uh, is is a quite impo important point. Yeah, and I think just to expand on that a little more as well, it's it's that the the spaces may be owned publicly or privately, and access may be public or private in terms of the control or the availability of it. And so to to give a few examples, somebody's own home is a private space that is also private access, whereas a cafe is privately owned, but it's public access. And so it's it's the the variety and mix of these spaces that provides the opportunity for different types of social interactions. And so I think you've made some really great points. If if we expand on this a little bit more, I don't think it was exactly the focus of your research, but you touched on the idea of perception of place and the way that people feel about place, therefore shaping the nature of social interaction that may occur in that place. The attitudes that they have towards where they live also shaping attitudes they have towards other people who live in that space as well and in, interact within it. And I think it's very easy for us to, to look at a, 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 play, a, a, a location that is undergoing shrinkage and say, that must be a terrible place to look. And I think this gets the idea again about policymakers looking at it may not really understand what the lived experience is. But I think at the same time, if we look at some of the fast growing urban areas, say if I look around where I live in Brisbane, there's some very fast growing urban areas. And the perception of place is much more negative than I would imagine the perception of place would be in some of these places that are undergoing uh, urban shrinkage. And so I was wondering if you had much, like any other observations through your research about the nature of that perception of place and how it isn't necessarily as bad as outsiders like myself perhaps thinks that it may be yeah uh very interesting question uh thank you for asking it uh one of my uh topic of uh, favorite topics um yes so initially um the first two topics i really wanted to look at when i started this research were social capital and place attachments um and in the end, place attachment is not so much a central topic in in um, in in this research, because um, during well during the research, uh, what came out what came up was that um, yes, the 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 overly dominant discourse was that people were attached to their place. Um, some people were less attached, but this came with you know sort of like, yeah, they were not from there, they were just passing, or um, this was not so much of a topic. Um, but what is certain is that indeed there was a gap between what we can see and think of these places from the outside when we read about their problems and the local experience. And the local experience was far more positive than what we might expect when reading uh, in quantitative terms about these cities. Um, so this is, um, yeah, like uh, unconditional, like for, it's definitely a fact. Um, and uh, and uh, it's sort of like, it was an initial puzzle because um, I could sense that definitely the experience of place and the, the experience of place was positive in most cases. Uh, the attachment to place was strong, uh, and yet there was a lot of discourse on this image of place, perception of place, quality of life. For instance, uh, the first thing that struck me was that people um, insisted a lot on um, 
um, quality of life, um, explaining why they were living here, why they chose to live here, why the place was good, all the advantages of the place. So this at the beginning was a little bit like puzzling to me because on the one hand, it, there seemed to be like an agreement on something, but at the same time, a topic that triggered people. And eventually what I understood was that there was an issue with this negative representation of place, which is mostly something that comes from outside. And um, and I, I the in the end, what I the, the the notion that I mostly explored was the notion of, of territorial stigmatization. So I I um, that there is definitely an issue with these places um, around territorial stigmatization, around the fact that there are negative imaginaries, stigmatizing imaginaries constructed around these places, and mostly from actors that are not from these places. So like the the national media or and um and so it's 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 really something that is um um affecting local residents and that they try to counteract with this um very positive discourse on place the the, the positive discourse is a strategy it's a strategy to to deconstruct the stigmatizing imaginaries especially when talking to me because i'm the outsider who's going to write about their city um so um yeah and i there's something very interesting that I observed during the um, study. Uh, it's that in interviews, people would uh, defend their city, all, uh, all its advantages, explain why they were super happy, super satisfied with their place. But they also said, yeah, all other people criticize. Other people say that, um, yeah, the city is going downhill, that things are bad, but I disagree with them. They shouldn't say that. And um, I disagree. The city is not so bad. It's has plenty of things to offer. We have everything we need here. And, and then when I was in groups, but I was not identified as a researcher, as it happened when I was in, more in situations of um, ethnographic observation, people didn't always know who I, knew who I was. Then I would hear this critical discourse. Um, so eventually I understood that mitigating the negative so there is a negative discourse some people internalize the negative imaginaries and they reproduce it and they criticize the place but they don't do it in front of the interviewer so in front of the, the interviewer the strategy is to mitigate the stigmatization by emphasizing the positive aspects of place yeah i i i could go on and on but uh yeah oh, that's that's fascinating and reflecting on my own experience when i was living in dunedin Everyone else in New Zealand thinks the weather in Dunedin is terrible. And so people who live in Dunedin take every opportunity they can to talk about how fantastic the weather is whenever it is good and and push back on and say, you know, like, if only the rest of the country knew just how great it was down here. Uh, so we can, I think we can see the same sort of thing happening all over the place. And and I, I am really interested in, it doesn't sound like we exactly have an answer, but I'm really interested in how just because there's a narrative that's that pushes back against that negative uh that that negative perception that might exist from outside of from outsiders just because there's a positive um, narrative doesn't mean that that negative narrative is still not having an effect a few double negatives there but it, but it's obviously very complex the way that there's a positive narr narrative and a negative narrative and they obviously interact with each other in ways that produce potentially some positive and some negative outcomes at the same time yeah, absolutely. Um, in Nevers, especially, which is uh, more affected by this issue of stigma than Dieppe, um, there's even a local word, um, which is Nievrose, uh, and it's a combination of Nievre, so that's the name of the region where Nevers is located, and neurosis, and it means the depression that you get from living there. Um, and it's really a combination of... Um, um, attachment to place, but anxiety because it's going downhill, uh, depression because there's nothing to do. Um, so the fact that this term exists um, is very significant, but of course it's not used by everyone and many people um, actually mention it to criticize it. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I also don't think we have an answer on how this exactly articulates, except th what I found that it's also a strategy to mitigate stigma. Uh, but um, yeah, they're definitely both things uh, playing side to side. And these sorts of things can can represent a an identity that can bring people together and and form uh, you know a sense of shared purpose and goals. If it, if 
if locals all are experiencing shrinkage and decline and impoverishment and services shutting down and businesses leaving, people leaving, then that's a commonality that can actually bring, bring people together and potentially have some positive effects in that that's social societal level. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a, I guess, for, for urban planners, it'd be great if they could look at how that sense of identity and shared purpose could be maximised to improve uh, the benefits that could be could come from social capital, rather than putting all their efforts into fixing the cracked pavements and you know uh, and urban development initiatives that don't necessarily fix any of the things that we're talking about. Um, just because there's you know some new pavement on the road doesn't mean people feel any different about place. That summarizes uh, some of my key points very well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um yes I, I i yeah i i i do agree very much with this and uh in terms of um what the collective uh identity and sense of place um involves or can create um i was thinking that um well my research focused on shrinking cities but uh there is also ongoing um, increasing talk on uh, left behind places um which is i mean they're not always equivalents, but in my case, uh, we're talking about places that are, that correspond to the definition of left behind regions or places. Um, and uh, I think in this framework, the this, this experience of place, sense of place, place identity is also very important because it can both, and I think the expression left behind uh, immediately touches more on this, um, I, I'm forgetting the words that you used exactly, but on this aspect of how you feel about place and how you feel collectively uh, as a local community in this place. Um, because yeah, the, the the term left behind says it, says it all. And it also mentions that there is something that can be negative uh, because when we're talking about left behind places, mostly we're talking about, I mean, most of this research has been talking about discontent, but I think the results that I highlight um, can also bring this more positive aspect of the narrative to this um, issue of discontent. So now we're with this topic, we're touching on you know bigger issue because it, it's very linked with um, um, political results, political behavior, um, and. Um, I think there is not just discontent. There's there's um, there's contentment with the place and discontent at how the place is considered. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a little town in New Zealand called Ahura, which is uh, where they've embraced the idea of being left behind, and uh, it's a fascinating example. I don't know that it's been any any academic literature has been published on it, but it's a fascinating example because it got to the point where all the shops had shut. And I think there was about 10, 12 people living in the town. And that's oh. how small it got. Um, oh. And then they embraced the idea that they were left behind. You know, the, they they named the highway, the, the forgotten highway. Um, you know, they embraced the idea that they were very remote and that no one lived there anymore. And then all of a sudden, this, it, there started to be urban development. There started to be people moving there. There was interest in it. And it started growing again. And last I heard, it was up to about 50 or 60 people. Uh, moving to this very remote, very rural location that was about to disappear off the map altogether, and so what it's happened? that perception. Well, I think it, I think it was the narrative. I think the locals embraced the idea of being uh, left behind, of being forgotten. You know, called it the forgotten highway. It started to become more of a tourist destination. You know, like it it got to the point where it was so bad it couldn't get any worse. There were no shops in town anymore, so it could only go up from there. And, and so I think this speaks to the power of, of how we perceive place can have a massive influence on how we interact with others and how others come to see the place. And that has obviously a lot of implications for, for urban development and for urban planning. And that's just one example. I'm sure there's many other examples where things have turned around purely because of the attitudes that people have towards it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, definitely. I think um, um, in 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 the literature on urban shrinkage, um, there is a, a strong criticism of um, the the what they call um, entrepreneurial urban policies that aim to 
um, redevelop the city at all costs, regrow it and attract, uh, you know, external entrepreneurs, external um, uh, families, uh, middle class families, ideally. And uh, I, I, I mostly agree with this critique because it does raise issues in terms of um, uh, social spatial justice and um, effectiveness again. Um, but um, what I could see from 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 my my perspective during my study was that um, so uh, basically I, I I mentioned the policy in Dieppe, but the policy in Nevers is quite the opposite of Dieppe. It's it's very much entrepreneurial, very much trying to attract you know startup companies, qualified professionals. So very much in this vein of entrepreneurial uh, municipal policies, and um, and the interesting thing that I could observe was that. It also um, uh, spoke to the people, the local people, in terms of image. So um, the issue was not so much does it work or not, uh, which is the answer that the literature tries to answer. And I sort of agree with the literature that it doesn't really work. But for the locals, it meant our city is moving forward, uh, orient future oriented, innovative, and um, even for people who were very remote from these economic sectors, like, for instance, elderly people, uh, it spoke to them sometimes very positively as, a, you know, a modern place, basically, a, a place moving forward, turned uh, dynamic, etc. So they, this was the very positive aspect for them. Yeah, that's so important. Those attitudes are so important. Uh, so, so I wonder, are there any further questions from the audience? Uh, there was a comment in the chat about, um, is there an opportunity for urban renewal or sustainable development because of urban shrinkage? So I know you've been talking about that a bit already. If you have any, if any, if any other thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so um, I guess the question meant specifically urban renewal, but in a sustainable way, right? Or from what I understand. Um, well, yeah. Um, so there is um, th this is um, a little bit outside the scope of my own research, uh, since I was uh, mostly looking at, uh, you know, everyday experiences for residents and uh, everyday negotiation strategies. So more informally than urban policy. Um, that being said, um, there is this is this is a strong um, hypothesis that is formulated uh, in the literature on urban shrinkage, um, and, and it's uh, often um, gathered under the term of greening shrinking cities, um, greening redevelopment. Um, this has been part of the a major part of the urban strategies that have been implemented in many shrinking cities. Uh, mostly because uh, there is an abundance of uh, brownfields. So there is an opportunity to create green space. Um, but this is also um, a very, very tricky issue because uh, there are many difficulties to that. Um, for instance, um, brownfields are generally polluted. So um, the first solution that comes to mind is uh, make it a park. But it's often very costly, very difficult, and not always possible to make it a park when it's the, the, the soil is heavily polluted. Um, when it's possible, uh, then it raises issues in terms of um, um, gent gent gentrification and increasing inequality or increasing segregation in the city, because it creates highly attractive places. Um, and the people who are more deprived uh, in these places are completely excluded from these redevelopments. Um, so because, of course, the, the goal is to, you know, um, make the real estate market dynamic again. So um, so and to raise real estate values. So the houses are for private sector in general, the houses that are, for instance, redeveloped nearby parks. Um, and then this is specifically specific to the US. There's been also a lot of ideas around the fact that since places were um, almost abandoned in some um, parts of it, um, well, um, why not uh, make them go, go back to nature, basically? So um, take out the highways, uh, destroy the houses, um, the, tear down everything, and uh, let's give it back to you know forests and um, 
And um, yeah, uh, well, I think that there, there are sort of two aspects to that. On the one hand, we're, we're reaching like very innovative ideas of, yeah, that it does sound great. And when it's possible, I do think it's great if, uh, um, for instance, in the case of a highway that has been completely abandoned and not maintained anymore, why not take it out? Indeed. Uh, this is a case that doesn't exist in France, by the way, not only in the US. Um, um, but often what was a little bit overlooked in these propositions was that there were still people living in these places. And generally, uh, the most marginalized communities were living in these very sparsely populated areas. So uh, deciding from one day to the next that the area is canceled and people have to relocate to an entirely other part, entire, entirely other part of the city, uh, this is also problematic. And in general, these theoretical ideas and these plans, they, they, they haven't been implemented fully because it raises too many problems of relocating people against their will, basically. So yeah, there, there's been a whole range of um, greening redevelopment strategies uh, theorized and experimented from the most low-key to the most radical. Yeah, certainly a, a challenge and something that we might need to do more of in the future. So let's let's wrap up this session. Uh, Celine, we really appreciate all the time and effort you've put into to presenting this. Uh, it's really fascinating you, research Tristan. that you've done. It's been great to hear about it. Yeah, it's been a great opportunity to talk about it as well. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. So our, our webinar series continues next week. We have to have Dr. Shanar Rashid, who's going to be talking about social capital and financial reporting. The value of social relationships can now appear on a financial statement. So that sounds like it'll be an interesting presentation. And then we're going to take about a, a month break from the webinar series, um, and then we'll pick back up again in July. So great, everyone could attend. Thanks again, Celine. I look forward to the next one. Yeah, thank you, everyone.